Hey everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and we have just watched the latest installment of NXT TakeOver. This one being, of course, NXT TakeOver in your house. And before we talk about any of the matches, it is worth mentioning the production of this show because obviously we got uh, an opening performance from the band Code Orange who seemed really angry for no... No reason, are they okay? And during that performance there was some lovely grungy 90s production and then once it ended we saw the set and we saw that everything was set up in an old school in your house way. We had the fake, you know, the house with the front door and the window on the stage. We had the garish 90s colour scheme, the blue and the purple and the yellow. It all looked really unique. It was a good effort I think by WWE to give the performance centre an entirely different feel for this kind of dedicated 90s style event. And we even had small little commercials in between the matches for things like Ico Pro, plugged by Adam Cole. We had Regal doing some hilarious voiceovers for the WWE ice cream cookie sandwich confectionery, whatever it was. We had Todd Pettengill as well, shilling merch in old school fashion. It was nice, there were nice little touches, but how good was the event in general? Well, we're gonna have to take a look. This is what happened at NXT TakeOver in your house. We start things off with the six-woman tag team match pitting the babyface team of Tegan Knox, uh, Shotzi Blackheart and Mia Yim against the heel team of Candice LeRae, Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez. And this match was kind of a kind of a TV match but wrestled at a slightly higher pace with slightly more intensity. Uh, but its real strength was doing a good job of highlighting all the various different interwoven feuds between the competitors in this match. So we had Tegan Knox and Dakota Kai going back and forth a bit. We had a bit where Candice LeRae was knocked to the outside side and Mia Yim was ready to pounce on her but Gonzalez stepped in the way and cut that off. We had a bit of back and forth between Tegan Knox and Raquel Gonzalez which was really good because of course it was Gonzalez who cost Tegan Knox that, that blood feud, that grudge match against Dakota Kai. Towards the end Mia Yim and Candice LeRae brawled to the back leaving it as more of a traditional two on two tag team match and it seemed like oh who's going to win here. At this point I still thought the heels were going to win but I was quickly proven wrong. There was a miscommunication between Dakota and Raquel with Dakota accidentally booting her henchwoman, her heavy, in the face. Uh, the baby faces then quickly got Gonzalez out of the ring, isolated Dakota Kai and put her away with a big double team finish and the baby face team picked up the big win to start the show. Next up we had a match between an established star, one of the biggest superstars in all of NXT in Finn Balor, taking on more of an up and comer in the form of Damian Priest. And Balor got the match underway in intense fashion, ambushing Priest before the bell with a big shotgun dropkick, but Priest worked his way quickly back into the match and it seemed like he was mostly taking control of the early stages. But Balor of course was able to fight back despite the big size disadvantage and showed off his incredible strength at one point with a really nice brain buster on the far taller man. It devolved into a bit of a brawl on the outside where Priest regained control, hurling Balor into the ring steps, launching him with a razor's edge onto the ring apron, which just looked nasty. Remember, of course, I believe I've, I've heard unconfirmed reports that the apron is indeed the hardest part of the ring. There was also a big choke slam from the top rope to Balor, crashing back down into the ring, but Priest couldn't put him away. So he set up for basically what looked like it was going to be like an ultimate devastation move, laying the flat half of the ring steps outside the ring, getting on the apron with Balor on his shoulders and basically looking to raise his edge him off the apron onto that flat hard ring step surface. But before he could throw Balor, Balor slipped down the back, landing in the ring, turning round and just knocking him off the apron with a big forearm and Priest landed, oh it looked pretty nasty, landed back first on what looked like the edge of that ring step surface and that was the beginning of the end. Back in the ring, Balor hit him with a coup de grace to the back and then a coup de grace to the front and that was easily enough to pick up the victory. But it wasn't an easy victory if that makes sense. It was an easy finish but Priest put up a good fight for the majority of this contest. And you could maybe argue that Priest should have perhaps won this match somehow, getting one over on the far bigger superstar to create a new star in NXT in the form of Damian Priest. However, I think that this match was booked in a way that really did help Priest. He could hang with Bala, he came close to victory a few times, and it certainly didn't damage him. I don't think it was a damaging loss. I think it was just one that proved that Bala was just a cut above. Afterwards, with Priest down and recovering in the corner, Bala did his whole signature you know bullet club or the club taunt and, and I don't know if it was meant to be a sign of respect or a sign of dominance like oh I've just beaten you 
look at my gun fingers, but Priest sort of raised his arm, and I don't know if he was going to do one back, but we cut away before you could really tell what was going on. A little bit frustrating there, but on the whole, I think this was one of the stronger matches on the show. I'll say it was probably my second favourite match of the event. Next up, the match that I thought was really going to steal the show and be match of the night, but upon reflection, I don't actually think that it was. It was still fine. Uh, I'm talking about the North American Championship match between the champion Keith Lee and his challenger Jonathan Gargano, Mr. Wrestling himself. And a quick shout out, of course, to Keith Lee coming out with the Black Lives Matter uh, logo on the back of his ring gear. It's really nice to see and obviously a very important message. This was a pretty long match. They started off slowly, so you could tell it was going to go fairly long. Uh, it was a nice battle between size and strength and agility and nimbleness, except of course Keith Lee isn't just big and strong, he's very agile in his own right too. But then we got something that really irritated me, and when Gargano made his entrance, he came through the front door of the set and then got the keys that he'd used to jab Keith Lee in the eye with on NXT this week, and sort of locked the door as if to be like, oh there's no escape for Keith Lee, and then he kept the keys in his trunks. A little way into the match, Pretty early on, actually, Gargano decided, I don't want any of Keith Lee, I want to escape, and it, it didn't make sense to me. There are a couple of reasons I didn't like this moment. One, I'm not a fan of heels trying to escape from title matches, even if they're cowardly heels. I feel like the lure of winning a title should be enough to kind of overcome your fears, even if you are a heel. You should try and cheat to win, obviously, and try and take loads of shortcuts, but you shouldn't just be escaping from the match and walking away from the title. I just feel like it didn't really fit with Gargano's character. The second reason I didn't like it is why didn't he just go through the curtain that most people were entering through? Why did he try and go through, the, through this door? He wasn't able to open the door and there was a camera in the peephole of the door which showed Keith Lee stalking up behind Gargano and slamming him into the door, which was a nice unique camera angle, but it didn't it didn't forgive the spot for me. I still wasn't really a fan of it, logic-wise. The match continued with Gargano working a very heelish, sneaky style, trying to work the hand of Keith Lee, weaken that, and at one point, reversing the Big Bang catastrophe really nicely, rolling almost like Bret Hart or something. No, it was more like, it was kind of like Eddie Guerrero, rolling it into a lovely pinning predicament, but it was only enough for a two count. And with Gargano back in control of the match, he capitalized with a suicide dive into a DDT on the outside, and that left Keith Lee totally unconscious on the floor, but Gargano was unable to get him back in the ring to pin him because Keith Lee is just way too heavy to pick up. And then we got our second moment in this match where I just I felt like the logic fell apart slightly with Gargano in desperation as the referee neared a 10 count, rolling back into the ring, grabbing the ref to stop the count and pleading with him not to count Keith Lee out. Instead, why didn't he just roll himself back in the ring and then roll back to the outside? We know through the rules of wrestling, the very inconsistent rules of wrestling, admittedly, that that breaks the count. If someone rolls in and then out again, that resets the count back to one, doesn't it? But then Gargano eventually did, you know, break the count by pleading with the referee, then rolled back to the outside, which would have reset the count anyway, remember? But it doesn't matter, I'm gonna calm down. He walked around the ring and Keith Lee just pounced him out of nowhere into one of the plexiglass barricades, into the crowd, and it was a nice big spot. Lee then dragged Gargano back around to the entrance ramp, put him over his shoulder and walked him back to the ring. It looked like he was gonna finish off Gargano once and for all. But then Candice LeRae came out to try and stop him, and I feel like this was a little bit rushed. So Candice came out, Keith turned around and was like, oh no, Candice is here. But then immediately Mia Yim was out after her to nullify the interference. So that felt a little bit rushed. We had, boom, Keith Lee's there with Gargano. He has Candice and he is Mia Yim straight away to stop her from interfering. I would have liked if they'd let that segment breathe just a little bit more. But with the referee distracted by Candice and Mia Yim's brawl on the outside, on the other side of the ring by this point, Gargano got the key out of his trunks and jabbed Keith Lee in the eye once again. And it looked for a second like he was about to steal a victory and the North American title. But then Keith Lee just went into ultimate kick out of everything mode, uh, which kind of works when it's Keith Lee. I think it works for certain superstars and Keith Lee probably is one of them. Gargano with the slingshot DDT for a very convincing near fall, which I totally fell for watching it live. Uh, then a super kick for two, then another super kick for two, and then a third super kick again for two. And now with Gargano desperate, he fell victim to a spirit bomb and the big bang catastrophe. And that was enough for Keith Lee to pick up the win and retain his title. Once again, uh, I was a little bit disappointed by this match, not in terms of the wrestling. I'm a big fan of both Gargano and Lee. I think they're both fantastic. And I think their wrestling, the bits of this match where they were just wrestling each other, it was really strong. That was very much the strength of this match. The weakness of this match was all the other stuff around it. As I mentioned, I wasn't a fan of Gargano trying to escape. I wasn't a fan of Gargano forgetting the rule about breaking the count. He's maybe Mr. Wrestling. 
after all. He is Jonathan Wrestling, and he forgot the rules of wrestling. And I wasn't too big a fan of Candice and Mia Yim's interference. I think that was a little bit rushed as well. The wrestling was great, but the other things certainly did drag the match down just a little bit. Next up, the latest in the ever-growing collection of cinematic matches, a very broad, very loose definition, but one that we kind of use to group these matches together. The latest installment in this sort of trend that is ongoing. Adam Cole defending the NXT title against Velveteen Dream in a backlot brawl, baby. Oh, that's cheesy. The first thing to know is that this was a little bit of a surprise because it wasn't main eventing the show. Uh, we've often seen these cinematic matches, main event shows like the Boneyard match on the first day of WrestleMania 36, like for example, over an AEW, the Stadium Stampede match for example as well. Uh, but this did not main event the show, which meant that the women's title match was actually main eventing, and that will prove to be a really good call. But yeah, the reason this match fell down, I think, was for two reasons, which I will get into before I talk about what happened in the match itself. I think it's better to just get these out of the way. First of all, I think the tone was a little bit off. I feel like they didn't go all in on comedy and they didn't go all in on seriousness. And what we got instead was a bit of an ineffective mishmash of the two. And the other thing, and the more glaring thing, in my opinion, that really let this match down was the production. Uh, the camera quality, the, the cuts were really, really all over the place, very jarring stuff. It felt like, you know, that trend in Hollywood about 10 years ago of like, the Bourne films with all the shaky cams and everything. It just didn't, it didn't really work in this context. Also, the lights of the, the headlights of the cars surrounding the ring really distracted me as well. So you could say the production wasn't great. You could say that the tone of the match wasn't great, but what actually happened in the match itself? Well, let's start with the entrances. Adam Cole arriving in a, oh, just that old wrestling trope, that WCW style thing itself, the custom monster truck with the Undisputed Era logos all over it. It looked, it looked pretty cool to be fair. And then Dream making his entrance in a very flashy, very fitting a yellow Lamborghini. Lovely stuff. Um, but Owen pointed out to me that he was dressed as a character from The Walking Dead, which I've never watched. So thanks very much, Owen, for setting me right there. Um, I, he, had, he had a nice red scarf. The character is called Negan. 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 Ne character's called Negan. Walking Dead. As part of his outfit, Dream had a baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire and Cole wisely refused to enter the ring until Dream put that down. Very sensible decision there from our NXT champion. And then Dream did put the bat down, not just put it down, he threw it outside of the ring to the parking lot floor below. You idiot. Cole got in the ring, tried for a bell shot, but Dream was ready for it actually and rolled him up for a near fall. A few minutes into the match, Cole said, right, that's it, I'm leaving. It works in this case rather than in Gargano's case because Cole is defending the title and he's not risking anything by, by just leaving the match. However, I feel like it still didn't work because only one match ago, we'd seen a very similar spot. Cole tries to leave by getting in a different car that was just left there. I guess by one of his cronies, I suppose. Uh, but Dream stops that by getting on the car and just attacking it with the baseball bat. Some lovely shattered windscreens and windows and that sort of thing. Uh, and then Cole, you know, gets out and tries to make a run for it. Then they start brawling again, but this time outside of the ring, they're still in just sort of the general parking lot area, back and forth, until they're interrupted by a car pulling up right in front of the camera. And I'm thinking, oh, here comes an interference. Is it gonna be Kyle O'Reilly? Who's it gonna be? No, it's um, just an Uber. And the woman inside goes, someone called an Uber? They fight through the backseat of the Uber, and then they get out and the Uber drives off. I felt, like, I felt like I was missing a punchline. I felt like there was meant to be more of a payoff there. It just seemed like randomness for randomness's sake. I, and I feel like as well, it was part of what I mentioned earlier about the tone being off. They didn't go all in on the joke, but they didn't keep it entirely serious either. And I think if they were gonna commit to one or the other, it would have served the match a lot better in the long run. Cole then hid in a nearby building. And when Dream opened the door to try and find him, he came out with a fire extinguisher. Bonus points for that. I love a fire extinguisher spot. It goes back to my childhood love of big Steve Blackman. But it wasn't long before Dream took control of the match once again, laying Cole across the bonnet of a car, climbing up a ladder and looking to hit the big elbow drop onto the hood of the car. Uh, unfortunately, he was then interrupted by an actual interference this time, not just from a rogue Uber driver, but from the Undisputed Era. Or at least, should I say, two members of the Undisputed Era, because Bobby Fish was there and Roderick Strong was there, but there was no sign of Kyle O'Reilly and he didn't turn up at any point in the match. I don't know if I've maybe missed an announcement or something. Is he possibly injured? If you do know, pop a little comment in the section down below. With Dream distracted, Cole headed up the other side of the ladder, but Dream knocked him off and Cole fell and just cracked the windshield of the car below him. And we got a lovely laceration 
on his arm. I suggest that's probably fake, uh, and I'm glad it was, because you don't want to be messing about with broken glass, do you, Adam? Fish and Strong then beat up Velveteen Dream and checked on Adam Cole, and he directed them to the back of his monster truck, where there were loads of steel chairs, and they just started throwing them in the ring. They went to get one that had landed outside the ring, but it was just yanked under the apron by an unseen figure. Could it have been Hornswoggle himself? No. It was Dexter Loomis. This week on NXT, Loomis obviously drew a nice little sketch depicting him driving off with the Undisputed Era. And he did just that. He threw Fish and Strong into the back of a car and just drove off. He has kidnapped half of the Undisputed Era. Although now that I think of it, has he previously kidnapped Kyle O'Reilly? Is that what's happened? I don't, once again, please do remind me in the comment section down below because I'm, I'm a bit confused. Back in the ring and we got the closing sequence of the match with Dream hitting the Death Valley Driver for two, then hitting the Purple Rainmaker onto Adam Cole seated in a chair, but again, Cole managed to kick out. It looked, however, as though Adam Cole's year-long reign was about to come to an end as Dream picked him up and said, Dream over. And then Cole just hit him with a lovely, a classic, low blow. That was enough to turn the tide decisively. Cole headed up top, hit the Panama Sunrise onto the Mountain of Chairs, and that was enough for the win. And Adam Cole is still the NXT champion. Not a great match in my opinion. They went for something here, but once again, for reasons that I've already mentioned, it just didn't quite click for me. I'm glad that Cole's title reign didn't end in this match because it would have been a bit of a disappointing ending to a fantastic title reign. Next up, the penultimate match of the night, and I think maybe the shortest match of the night, about five or six minutes long, as it should have been, I think, Karrion Cross with Scarlet Bordeaux, of course, taking on Tommaso Ciampa. And really, there's not a lot to talk about in this match. It can just be summed up like this. Uh, Karrion Cross was dominant from the off. Ciampa fought back with some big moves of his own, like the draping DDT for a very close near fall, some running knees, some running boots to the head, but Karrion Cross was just too big and strong. Ciampa at one point went for the fairy tale ending. It looked like he might have a chance to win the match, but Cross just stood up, lifted him onto his shoulders and hit that big variation of the F5 and then locked on the cross jacket and Ciampa passed out. A very straightforward, very decisive win for Karrion Cross. And I think it's probably the right way to do it. I like that Ciampa didn't tap out, he passed out. Tapping out would have been against his character. But otherwise, he was absolutely destroyed here. And I do think it was the right way to go about it. Yes, he's one of the most successful stars in NXT history, but in beating him so decisively, we've got a new star in Karrion Cross. And just before the main event, we get a lovely shot of Code Orange in the crowd after their opening performance. Again, still looking very angry for no reason. Well, the world is a bad place at the minute. Maybe they're angry at the world, who knows? We also get a lovely shot of Robert Stone, who was recently, of course, fired by Chelsea Green, and he looks like he's been drinking, and he's just resting against the NXT sign, just stroking it gently, and I'm excited to see where this goes actually. And finally, the main event of the night, the NXT Women's Championship match with the champion Charlotte Flair taking on both the woman that she beat for the title at WrestleMania, Rhea Ripley, and also Io Shirai. And for most of the opening stages, I think Charlotte was largely in control. She was portrayed as the strongest and best wrestler of the three, but Io and Rhea were just flying about like absolute wild cards at times. At one stage, Rhea flying with a scent on to the outside off the apron and just landing flat on her back. It looked a bit nasty. And then we got what I'm going to call kind of the false finishing sequence of this match. You know, we're used to false finishes in matches. This was kind of a false finishing sequence where you sensed that the finish was coming, but then nobody got the decisive pinfall or submission and the match just carried on and escalated further. In this kind of false finishing sequence, we got a double spear from Charlotte for a couple of near falls. We got various different roll-ups for near falls. We got Io reversing the riptide into like kind of just a, a slam, a crossbody of her own, and then getting Charlotte in a cross face, but Rhea breaking that submission up. It was very good uh, and it kept things unpredictable. You couldn't tell who was about to win the match. And in the end, of course, nobody did and it just continued. The best near fall of all, I think, was probably when Rhea evaded a natural selection from Charlotte but then Io came in and took control, but then Charlotte reversed momentum and then she hit the natural selection on Io and then Io kicked out at two. That seemed like it could have been the end of the match. Charlotte then got the figure eight on Rhea Ripley, which of course she beat her with at WrestleMania, but this time Io Shirai was on hand to drag Charlotte out of the ring and then hit the ropes back in the ring and dive to the outside with just a wonderful, it was kind of a suicide dive, but she twisted her body in midair and turned it into a picture-perfect crossbody. It was really well done. They headed all the way up the ramp to the In Your House set, the backdrop, and Charlotte just threw Io through one of the windows and then 
got into a big messy brawl with Rhea, which was a distraction while Io climbed up to the top of the house, the In Your House house, and dived off with a, just a sick crossbody, taking out both women below. And it was executed about as cleanly as you could, given the angle, it, it was really nicely done. Back in the ring eventually, and Rhea Ripley hit a riptide from the corner into the ring, the move that she beat Shayna Baszler with to win the NXT Women's Championship originally, but this time, Io Shirai broke it up. And then we got the finish of the match with Charlotte Flair in the figure eight, bridging up fully, Rhea Ripley looking like she's about to tap out, and Io Shirai heading up top, hitting a moonsault onto Rhea Ripley, and picking up the huge win. One thing to note here, uh, Io did kind of land on Rhea's face, it looked like her knees might have gone right into Rhea's head, but Sean Ross Sapp tweeted that uh, he heard that apparently Rhea was saying she was fine as she headed through the curtain after the match. So that is some good news. Rhea Ripley does appear to be okay. But yeah, as for the finish, I mean, I called it on the predictions, guys, whatever. But no, it was a really effective finish. I think it was the right decision as well. I'm very excited to see what Io Shirai can do as the NXT Women's Champion. And it's clear that NXT as a brand are very excited as well because Io got the full confetti celebration. There was streamers and everything. It looked really nice. And yeah, it's just generally the beginning of a new dawn for the NXT women's division. So that is it for what happened at NXT TakeOver in your house. A pretty good show in my opinion. Yes, some weak points, some slightly disappointing points, such as Cole versus Dream in that slightly misguided, I think, cinematic match. Uh, Keith Lee and Gargano was good action-wise, but other things let it down. But other matches like Balor versus Priest, and especially that women's triple threat main event, really did carry the show through. And I think it's probably worth a watch. If not, you know, if for nothing else, than that main event. So thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack from cultaholic.com. Let me know what you thought of the show in that comment section down below. And there's not much more to say. Stay safe out there, stay positive, and I'll see you soon.